Uh, so we're going to start strong with this one. This is uh, Wyatt Earp's Old West. Now, um, don't know what this one entails. Fucking yeehaw indeed. Um, I only just watched uh, Tombstone this year, and it, that's about Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday and, you know, Showdown at the OK Corral. But God, it was a, it was a really good movie. Um, I quite enjoyed that. And I, I got into, my, my mate Matey got me onto a channel where it was, um, so I have that movie on VHS, holy shit. Um, but yeah, I got, I got onto a channel on YouTube called Space Ice that just um, showcases the wonders of all these cool old action movies. And he did a movie on Tombstone. And it was like five reasons why Tombstone is the greatest Western ever. And it's like just five arrows all pointing at Val Kilmer as Doc Holliday. Like... Yeah, he, he was the best thing about it. And, uh, yeah, best thing about the movie, uh, also whilst being up against, like, Kurt Russell, Michael Bean, Sam Elliott, all those sweet ones. But let's let's open this up and have a look, shall we? Um, turn that off. Put that up. But, yeah, this is apparently, like, um, yeah, just... Oh, amazing media. Okay, we still have to check out... Oh, hang on. Millions of Americans came west. Seeking fortune and adventure. Among them was Wyatt the, um, Earp, a legend on. of a man best known for his gunfight at the OK Corral. Most people remember him as a lawman, but he was also a buffalo hunter, a saloon keeper, a gambler, and a prospector. Some even say he was a murderer. Wyatt's gone now, as are all the others, and our town's quite empty. But their <laughs> spirits live on. The spirit of the old west. Spirit of the old so, west. Come with me to explore this old town. Discover the story of Wyatt Earp and what life was really like in the old west. Yeah, cool. That sounds like fun, actually. Howdy, partner. <laughs> and welcome to Wyatt Earp's old west. <laughs> We're back west. to playing Mad Dog McCree, I see. I'm George. See what and kind I'm of George. shot you are, Pilgrim. This here's the signpost. Clicking it helps you to do a lot of things. For example... Click town to begin roaming around. You could do this right now and bypass the rest of my directions. Yeah, we want some directions. Click shoot out to go directly. I'm liking to this guy. He kind of looks like yeah. Yeah, we actually Click watched. Uh, Matey and I watched uh, Blazing Saddles again this weekend. He's reminding me of Gene Wilder. So I talk to people who play scum. Yeah. <laughs> Click lingo to learn more about the Western terminology. Huh? Click exit. To leave the program. The Click program. Help for advice on using the program. Click save. Why before pronounce you it leave like so that? The program will remember what you've collected. Click load. Like what so accent is that in America? You, you'll be able to tell me, Skay. Uh, during your visit, a few other tools of the trade will come in handy. You'll find these at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. First, there's the picture of the signpost. Yeah. Click that to come back here. Then there's the money bag. When you answer my questions right or shoot the bad guys, I'll put more money in. Ah. And you can use these coins in the one arm bandit, which you'll find Ooh. in the saloon. Oh, man, this is sounding fun already. You can also click on the small picture of a map to see the whole town at once and where you're standing. Yeah. Okay. And don't forget to click on the gun behind the Wyatt Earp sign at the bottom of the screen to turn your pointer into a gun. Ooh, yeah. You should do this pretty quick if a gunfighter jumps out at you. Oh, uh, okay. So it's click on the gun to use the gun, I guess. Can I shoot you? Oh, I can't shoot him. I did like that, though. Like, they had the FMV of the guy, but they also, like, drew in his legs, and it looked like the bottom of his torso was, like, elongated. But, yeah, no, I'm, in I'm intrigued, too, because, um, yeah, Amazing Media did two games around about the same time. They were... Um, Frankenstein Through the Eyes of the Monster and um, Mummy, the Tomb of the Pharaoh, uh, which had respectively Tim Curry as Dr. Frankenstein and Malcolm McDowell as a, um, like a, not an archaeologist, a, a, some mine owner thing. But yeah, they were pretty interesting too. Let's let's jump in the town. Let's, I, I'm intrigued. Oh, wow. So it's just first person like mist kind of thing. Okay, so we got the canteen, the corral, and the mission. Well, there's a the general store. Can we go in the general store? Hang on. Uh, and yeah, just, okay. They've just gone to an old west town and taken photos. 
Yeah, that's cool. This town's filling up, and there ain't enough room for both of us. Oh, crap. Um, oh, crap. We just got shot. Welcome to Boot Hill, partner. <laughs> Time to become a better shot, or you'll end up six feet under. Well, we tried. Did... Don't I have a gun? Who's here? Mrs. Wong and just someone... These three are the least fortunate <laughs> participants in the gunfight at the OK Corral. The display of bodies to the general oh, public... Oh, so they actually got to go to Tombstone and, like, and take no photos of what was three. there. After their deaths, their wow. silver-trimmed caskets were displayed in the window of a hardware store. And when oh, it came man, time that, that funeral, was morbid, the too, like having them through the crowded streets of Tombstone in the coffin and, and shit just in the middle of the street. Hearses. As the procession passed one point in town, wow. a friend of the victims... Oh, Cool Hold up so a far. sign reading, Murdered in the Streets of Tombstone. No, that's cool. All right. Who else this is here? This poor woman died from an infection sustained in childbirth. Bringing a child into this world was a much riskier proposition back in those days. Yeah, I can imagine. Mr. And... Johnson bought a horse that was stolen, although he didn't know that. <laughs> the folks that found him with the horse didn't know he didn't know. So he was taken for the thief. Well, they had the actual the photos same. of this shit. Well, that's, that's messed up. Okay, can we can we get out of Boot Hill, I guess? Okay, so we just, we're alive. We just get sent to Boot Hill if we die. Partner, oh. I got you a silver dollar if you can answer my question right. Okay, Boot Hill Graveyard was named for all the people who died with the... Boots as a headstone, guns on, boots stolen, boots on. I, I'm gonna say boots on. Hey, we won. We got some money. Nice. But yeah, no, this is this is cool as all hell. It really is. Oh, that was just a horse. I had my gun ready this time. Um, but yeah, no. So they've legit just gone around. Like, whatever they had set up in Tombstone in the 90s and just took photos and made it into, like, a little, like, FMV game thing. Yeah, take no risk, shoot horse. Yeah, I can get 10k at the traders anyway. Um, unfortunately, can't Why go Why was the there a oh. moon on outhouse doors? Well, yeah, if there was more packing. than one, the locals would mark the door with a moon or a star or the like to indicate which one was the ladies and which was for the gents. That's one theory, anyhow. Oh. I think the hole was cut to let some light in. Maybe the person who invented it got an unpleasant surprise one night, which is why folks only used the outhouse during the day. At night, most houses kept a chamber pot secluded in a nightstand by the bed. Mm-hmm. That's... Uh... Not a fun prospect. And that was the, the biggest thing. Like, the, the photos they always took back in the day always looked creepy as all hell. Oh, now we double go a little bit forward. Um, but that's cool. Yeah, like, even the even the actual scenery and shit's nice. Um, oh, uh, I don't know how I can get... Do I just click on the gun to use it? I, I haven't worked that out yet. Yeah, maybe we have to go and buy the a gun. The writers and the editors who came through this door might not have had credentials, but they certainly had a flair for the language. The Tombstone Epitaph's first editorial declared that Tombstone is a city set upon a hill, promising to vie with ancient Rome upon her seven hills in a fame different in character. Oh, and you can no like scroll through the importance. actual um, <laughs> thing. I wonder if that the, writer the news is article. overcome by the ink fumes. Oh, well, and they actually have, like, an account of the, um, the shootout at the OK Corral. No, that's mad. That's awesome. Her brother's justified. Well, there you go. Can we get out of here? I oh, know, we're stuck. No, there we go. I thought we were going to be stuck reading that paper forever. Don't want to... Wouldn't mind a six-shooter, though. Um, all right. But yeah, no, just really cool to just explore this sort of shit. Because we don't, yeah, like, we don't really get stuff like this in Australia, obviously. The closest thing we've got is um, you can go out to, so I'm in the state of Victoria. If you go right out into the sticks, um, you can go visit the old uh, gold fields because we had a massive gold rush in the 1800s. And you can go see, like, they've got something, a similar setup like this there. So like authentic things, people dress up and all that sort of thing. But um, I think you can see the Eureka Stockade. They had like a um, uprising where like 30 people got massacred or something like that. 
Oh yeah, and you've also got um, Glenn Rowan. Yeah, Glenn Rowan. Where um, if things had gone Matt different Kelly in Wyatt's start. life, you might have been able to look into this window and find him inside reading law books. You see, Wyatt's grandfather was a lawyer, and everyone in the Earp family expected him to become <laughs> a, a very legal plain eagle as well. Life there. When Wyatt's family headed out west, it was expected that Wyatt would continue his lawyering studies in California, but. Once Wyatt got a taste of adventuring, he set his mind against any vocation that would have held him back from the kind of life he had enjoyed on that covered wagon journey. Yeah, okay. Um, so we've got the lore offer. I do, I, I don't know. No, these signs look painted. Yeah, there was like little road signs back here that sort of um, might have been photoshopped in. Just seeing if we can go back to that. Yeah, these... Oh, Okay. So they're written in, we got the main stretch of town. Oh yeah, we got the uh, post office. We can go to the post office. No, horse troughs. But no, this is cool. This is, um... Ooh. Got someone just walking around. We got the barber shop. Gotta get a haircut, I guess. That there stubble's looking a bit long, partner. Care to step yeah, into the barber yeah, shop? Yeah, I, I, I like keeping it this way. The barber's an interesting sort of jack-of-all-trades. Might have been a part-time dentist, dentist in training, <laughs> yikes, physician, <laughs> mortician, palm reader, just a plain good listener. Remember now that marriageable women folk were in short supply in every old western town. So, the arrival of a new school teacher might send many a hard-boiled miner or cowpuncher scurrying down to the barbershop to spiff up a mic. Yeah, yeah, it's ultimately well, an educational game, but half of these, now? like, just interesting at the very least. Um, I think I've got another game there called Dust a Tale of the Wide West, which has, like, more... It, it, it's kind of like a... Uh, like a dungeon crawler, if anything, but set in an old west town. In Wyatt's time, there was no such thing as a can of shaving cream. You had to make it yourself. But taking this brush and stern against a bar of shaving soap. And they weren't just looking for a clean shave. You see, the barber used this shaving brush to touch up the little curves in Wyatt's long handlebar mustache. Ah, uh, yeah. That was a popular fashion mark. at the time. Doc Holliday had one, too. Perfect timing, too. We're actually up to um, Movember to here. Droopy mustaches. Yeah, cool. Yeah, no, my um, granddad used to shave with, um, just like stirring the sh soap with the brush. Each of these shaving and a bit of water belonged to one of the barber's customers. Having a real spiffy mug on display here was I think he actually did use a, a um, straight razor, too. a whole too. bunch of spiffy mugs sitting here was considered for you, a mate. real I'm glad I get to spend my last healing barber. day in stream. How are you, Anchor? Healing day? Oh, have you got uh, holiday time at the moment? For your quarter, you could pick your style of haircut. And men of Wyatt's generation had some odd tastes. Some actually asked the barber to shave their foreheads because they thought it made them look more intelligent. <laughs> okay. Wyatt's friend John Claw. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You got the wisdom teeth. Yeah, yeah like I forgot about that. He was going prematurely bald before yeah. he settled in as no, Mario Tombstone. No, it'll heal up eventually, mate. Like, yeah, Indian agent. benefits you in the long Apache run. called him Boss. And I did have poached eggs there. on toast this morning. You got me thinking about eggs when we were having a chat last night. The straight razors of Wyatt Earp's shaven oh, days a nice took one real too. skill to use. They were powerful sharp. In fact, this was a skill that few men wanted to master. Instead, they just pay a barber to shave them all pretty without cutting them up. For that service, 15 cents was considered a bargain. Yeah, no, that's fair. All right, any other this fun stuff? This little picture was here just to remind all the gents who they might be hoping to impress by getting themselves all <laughs> spruced up. <laughs> and Tombstone definitely had its share of ladies. Yeah, fair enough. Any other... Um... Besides hair tonics, barbershops oh, yeah, sold yeah, perfumes old school. like this here. I'd love to get some Both bottles like this. Yeah, the old school tonics alcohol, always had some sort of appeal to me. Mighty fine. Okay. And posters like this were just yeah. one way that barbers tried to persuade their customers to buy hair tonics. Another way was to talk you to death. <laughs> the New York Times noticed this in a 1879 editorial called Barbers Terrorize. Made himself Public. some sweet potato mash, plan, tasty, said, but it felt like eating baby food. To that extent, yeah, sweet potato is pretty good. Good for you, too. Of hair tonic in order to purchase a few moments. But yeah, no, you'd be able to get back to solid food soon, I imagine. <laughs> Oh, can we grab some keys? Oh, you can actually... What are the keys for, though? 
Oh, yep. Okay, so it's actually swinging towards like a point and click adventure. That's cool. This cabinet held a bunch of stuff, including shaving soap. Williams shaving soap was advertised as stimulating the pores of your skin. But around the time old Wyatt's whiskers started turning gray, folks discovered that this wasn't necessarily such a great idea. You see, barbers were using the same razor for all their customers. So once your pores were opened up... <laughs> okay, surgery was Thursday, so this is day right two of in. healing? Okay. They got a little while to go. But, One of the um, things atop this cabinet is a ceramic yeah, that, that, That's probably the most the important thing. Just days, keep it clean, like rinse it out with like, salt water and stuff. The saloon <clears> would usually be the first public building in town, and the barbershop would start out as a little curtained-off corner inside. Later, even after the barber got his own storefront, he might still serve whiskey as a sideline. Oh, really? Yeah, it also love like oh shit. If you answer my question right, <laughs> I'll give you a shiny U.S. silver dollar. Okay, now this is a cool way of doing it too. So you're learning stuff as you're in a like a room, and then he pops up and says, "Hey, answer this question. See if you're listening." Um, barbers at this time gained press and reputation for being terrific <laughs> doctors, con artists, astrologers, or talkers. Uh, let's go talkers. That gets me another silver dollar. Yeah, no, that's mad though. That's okay. So, we're, is this the Pony Express? Gave me some kind of minty antiseptic Welcome to the rinse. Express office. Yeah, nice. Back in the 1860s, the stagecoach was a frontier town's main connection to the rest of the world. Even after the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869, stage lines hmm. still carried people, mail, and gold back and forth from a town to the nearest train station. Yeah, that's cool. Since stagecoaches were vulnerable out on the trail, highway robbery was a right popular pastime. While Wyatt Earp was deputy marshal of Tombstone, he rode shotgun on the Wells Fargo stages to protect them. It's said that no stage was oh, ever yeah, robbed. Oh yeah, I, I keep Wyatt it. Yeah, I, I watch a guy called Nick Ricada, and said, um, folks like the he mentioned he used Wyatt to work for Wells Fargo, and, and apparently they've been around since. Wasn't yeah, riding. back Look in this time. Office. And at the stagecoach out on the street to learn more about the Stage Express. Oh, we can learn about the stagecoach and shit. Okay. Step right up, partner. Where you want to go? Tucson? El Paso? Stagecoaches were the primary means of getting from town to Ooh, town. Can we go to El Paso, West. though? I could fall in love with the uh, Mexican girl. 15 days and cost $300 to go from Omaha yeah, to Nebraska. Yeah, no, this is this definitely right from in, man. There's something. The trips were there's still like tough. A, People went Because we've seen some shit. We've One like you've been here long enough to know that we've Southern definitely Arizona found some shitty educational games. Again. But yeah, there's certain devs that have just been like really solid with them. Uh Bisbee, Yuma, El Paso, or San Francisco. Yeah, I suppose you got the furthest to go to get the bloody Wells Fargo San Fran. opened its first office in San Francisco, California in 1852. They offered folks a reliable way to send money and treasure back east and overseas. They even hired Wyatt to ride shotgun on their stages. In later years, Wyatt Earp lived near San Francisco, and in yet another famous incident was called on to referee one of the most famous prize fights of the time. The fighters, Bob Fitzsimmons and Tom Sharkey, couldn't agree on a referee, and at the last moment, the promoters of the bout called in Wyatt. Huh, According to really? the Associate Press, when he stepped <clears throat> into the ring, the crowd of 20,000 howled for Earp. Huh. There you go. The job of an express office agent is never done, just like the job of Marshal Wyatt Earp. An agent would buy gold dust, forward and receive packages of every kind, fill out drafts for checks to be drawn on well, they banks. Got, like the original baggies. fucking they arrived like, receipts early, and shit. Most days stayed past or just ten like, at night. Work requests, delivery requests, or something. Yeah, that's cool. That's it. Yeah. Oh no, is this back out? Yeah, let's. Don't want to go back out. Oh no, hang on. Safes like this could be found in banks and express stations, and were the favorite target of robbers. Fortunately, safe cracking hadn't yet become a precise art, so the easiest way to get into one was with the combination. However, desperados were oh, well, we in get some, uh, their favorite method old school was dynamite. FMB. Of course, wow. sometimes they use a little too much. There's a great story of Butch Cassidy's robbery of a Union Pacific train. The guard on the train was stubborn and wouldn't let him in the baggage car, so they blew it up. <laughs> and after the smoke cleared, they discovered that not only was the guard okay, but the safe was still intact. So <laughs> they got more dynamite. 
You must have used just a little too much dynamite, though, because when the safe blew, <laughs> there was paper money littered all over the tracks. Ah, uh, yeah, not worth much then. All right, well, let's, let's try and go through this door that was here, though. Oh, it just takes us out to the back? Yeah, all right. Oh, and we get into the... Is this... Oh, this is like the Chinese section. Yeah, righto, righto. When Wyatt Earp lived in Tombstone, the town's Chinese enclave was called Hoptown. About four or five hundred Chinese folks lived there. And behind a door like this one lived Hoptown's unofficial ruler, Ah Lum, who was also known as China Mary. She was a shrewd businesswoman, and you all wanted to be nice to her. If you were Chinese, you couldn't get a decent job without her recommendation. But huh. she was also known for giving generous loans and gifts to miners who were down on their luck. Yeah, really. Yeah, like, yeah, the whole, all those gold rushes if just brought everyone If you knocked on some doors in China Alley, you would together, have found mostly men. America's restrictive immigration laws made it hard for anyone but male laborers to that's come a, over that's from That's a China. pretty good trip so, right there. over time, in some Chinese family, generations of men would become American residents. But each one would have to return to China to get married. And all the wives and daughters would have to stay in the old country. <laughs> made things kind of lonesome around here. I can imagine. Oh, yeah. Okay. What else we got? Yeah, more, more, more town. Just looking for other fun stuff to um, click on. Ooh, another Maintaining here. an opium den like this was a local Ooh, custom imported by that's China. That's like <laughs> This drug may have been highly addictive, but it was still legal in much of the West. So, as Deputy Marshal Wyatt Earp didn't have to worry about trying to shut this place down, he just had to come by and collect the taxes. Doing this was the entrance to the Chinese community. Oh, yeah, unfortunately, bathhouse. can't go into the like opium, the opium den, den though. Nearby, that's, that's having such a bathhouse was a custom imported from China. Westerners of Earp's day were still debating the merits of frequent bathing, <laughs> although in much of the dry west, taking a bath was an infrequent luxury. Not oh, bloody wrong. What else we got? Yeah, we got Hop Town. Oh, this this looks established. That's it's, it's kind of cool. Oh, we're going like further down into the street, I guess. Okay. Yeah, so this would be someone's buddy, mansion or something. A bit better put together than everywhere else. I can appreciate how these history lessons aren't all lighthearted, but the ones of somber tones really get you insight. Yeah, yeah, like you watch like even even like a lot of the old John Wayne ones sort of had that historical accuracy they did they if you were get a regular darker cow puncher as it went further on once you got like, like um, across town might bust your wallet pretty fast oh god what was the place like this one with ian mcshane where everyone said cocksucker um dust in the mine or watching cow behind that's end. the one drinking and gambling could cost you more than you'd bargain on you know how distilled spirits affect the average citizen well and Wyatt Earp's day, the average citizen on the next bar stool might be hiding a 45 caliber revolver, plus a mean temper to go with it. So this visit just might cost you your ability to breathe and maintain a heartbeat. <laughs> Speaking of old men and Earp's decline in years, someone once asked him why so many of his adventures had taken place in or around why is saloon. Why Sarsaparilla well, he worth more than beer? We had no YMCA's. What he meant was that in the old west, your saloons functioned as a kind of combined community center, art gallery, if you like cowboy paintings and a music <laughs> conservatory, all of a crude frontier sort. So don't let a little crudeness put you off. Take a look around the Bucket of Blood Saloon. Yeah, sweet. All right. Oh, a little bit lively in here. Yeah, fair enough. When men in Wyatt's Day took a hint from this sign and ordered whiskey, they drank it straight. It was considered effeminate to dilute your whiskey with soda or whatnot. And then you'd follow up with a chaser of water, milk, yeah, or yeah, buttermilk. Yeah, yeah, the well was pretty, tough, huh? pretty wild. All right. I, I, I have my child to one of our bandit here. Oh, we got to put money in there. Put in the old silver dollar. Oh, two horseshoes, which lets us four dollars. That's all right. All right. Let's put a bit more in. Yeah, nothing on that one. One more go. Horseshoe, horseshoe. Yeah, all right. No, that's good. I'm not a massive gambler. I like having a little bit of a. Win every now and then. 
Why? Oh, wow! Ah. You've probably heard the expression, there's no free Jesus, lunch. Jesus, what have I been drinking? Well, Freaking hell. That wasn't always true, <laughs> Buckaroo. In fact, why Earp city dwelling contemporaries could almost but always But yeah, this was, a, like, I brought it up a few a times, but this was the clever workaround to have, were drinking. you know, your smaller quick Life time videos. The threat of prohibition. Saloon keepers didn't want their patrons getting too drunk in public. And one way to restrain them was making sure they ate something while they drank. Even alcoholics could be persuaded to eat some solid food if it was free. Yeah, fair enough. Wouldn't have been very good if it were free. Let's look at the old piano. This piano was no doubt out of tune, something awful. But there were few sources of music in the West, and folks were right grateful for anything they could get. One of Wyatt Earp's contemporaries in Tombstone was a man named Haley, who manufactured pianos back in New York. He'd travel around the West with a knockdown demonstrator piano and a crew that would assemble it in front of potential purchasers. The man made a fortune that way. Sure didn't have much competition. Hmm, true that. Uh, else in the saloon. Oh, this yeah, picture tip -tip. reminds me of a story. <laughs> One Western alcoholic was said to have such an educated palate that when blindfolded, he could correctly identify any kind of liquor you put to his lips. But one day, someone finally handed him a drink whose taste he couldn't recognize. He took sip after sip, but it still didn't seem familiar. <laughs> it was water. <laughs> Around Western eating tables, unfamiliar cultures sometimes came together, each trying to shine their own light on each other. For instance, there was one old army surgeon who had married a Native American woman. One day he had some of his in-laws over for dinner and resolved to enlighten them with some Bible wisdom. Yeah, he told them the story I, I actually have a joke Eve where it is a glass of piss. Sin and suffering it's like a wine connoisseur going, all right, no, this is a 1963 Bordeaux or something, and the hobo says, drink this, tell me. One old chief oh, this tastes like piss. Like, that's him. right, now tell me well, that's how old I am and where I was born. Now, if that had been an Indian woman, <laughs> she would have taken a stick and killed that snake. Saved all the trouble. Yeah, okay. I actually missed that story. Ah, Partner, he's back again. If you answer my question true, I have a silver dollar for you. Okay, Western professional gamblers were sometimes known as bandits of the saloon, aces in the hole, knights of the green table, or rustlers of the deck. Um, maybe knights of the green table? Hey, we got it. Yeah, nice. All right. Um, so we were going. Let's look at the map. Where's? Oh, wait, look at all the stuff we can go to. This is amazing. All right, so we're here. Oh, and we can just fast travel. So what do we got? Assay office, auction yard, bank, barber, blacksmith, brewery, cantina, cemetery, China Alley, church, corral, courthouse, doctor, dressmaker, dry goods store, express office, firehouse. Freight company, gallows, general store, gun shop, hotel, laundry, law office, livery stable, marshal, Mexican residence, mission church, newspaper, opera hall, photo studio, post office, railroad station, ranch boarding house, residence, restaurant, saddle maker, saloon, saloon, school, theater, trading post, train, undertaker. Wow. What's, can we just go straight to the marshal's office? Nice. All right. The mayhem of western towns was kept in check by local ordinances requiring cowpunchers to check their guns when they arrived. So fights were most often contests with fists or long knives. When a cowpuncher checked his guns with a clerk or bartender, he received a, a ticket bartender. with which to claim his weapons when he was ready to leave town. If he didn't check it, he could land in jail. Yep, yeah, that's fair enough. For many western lawmen, Wearing a badge didn't interfere with maintaining a profitable, parallel career as an outlaw. In fact, some towns deliberately hired an infamous gunslinger as their sheriff on the assumption that he could intimidate lesser troublemakers into behaving themselves. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Your well. lawman's job wasn't really all that glamorous, nor was his salary very high. But the fringe benefits were great. The job was a real fine springboard into politics if you were so inclined. Oh. Also, a sheriff got to keep a percentage of all the taxes he collected, and that could amount to quite a bit in boom towns. For example, Wyatt Earp's longtime rival, Sheriff Johnny Behan, was said to pull in some $40,000 a year that way. Bloody hell. <laughs> and every one of them dollars went a long way in 1881.
Yeah, not wrong. Bloody hell. Alright, so we can go into the jail. Yeah, now this, like, they put a bit of effort into this, this is for damn sure. Oh, yeah, here's the old lynching rope, I guess. It took a special kind of rope to hang a person right. Most proper hangman's nooses were made from hand-woven hemp rope. This rope was well-oiled to strengthen the rope and ensure that it would stretch and not break when its victim's full weight fell on it. Mm-hmm. Rifles were a popular choice for the lawman trying to hunt down fugitive criminal. The longer the metal barrel, the more accurately you can shoot. The inside of the barrel has spiral grooves cut into it, which helps the bullet shoot straight. In fact, the word rifle comes from the French word rifle, which means to scrape or scratch. Yeah, okay, there you go. You keep a pitcher and wash basin around for washing your face and body. It was a simple operation. The pitcher was kept full of clean water, which you poured into the basin. Then you used your hands to scoop water out of the basin and splash it on your face. Hmm. Uh -huh. Women like the Earps occasionally received requests for help from sheriffs in neighboring areas who'd wire something like, Outlaw Curly Bill escaped from Tucson. Stop. Headed east toward Huachuca Mountains. Stop. Please intercept. I gotta cuss Why your fortune if I can do Morse code the for the Huachuca. But this map would sure tell him. Yeah, God, yeah, you'd need the map, that's for sure. Oh, no. Oh, no one's actually in the jail itself. Okay, they're just showing it off. Can't. Oh, no, that's all you can do in there. All right. So show us off the show us the riffles. Yeah. To try to keep things calm and to gun safety, stone, mate. Virgil you Wyatt don't Earp point at what you don't want to shoot. Not carry guns in town. All the parties were supposed to deposit their firearms at the sheriff's office. Now, this was in theory. In practice, no one did. In fact, the Earp brothers' first recorded attempt to enforce this law was the final challenge. It started those bullets flying at the OK Corral. Ah, okay. That's what started it all. Yeah, fair enough. A good lantern came in real handy, especially when you had a house full of drunks, horse thieves, and hooligans. <laughs> if the lights went out, who knows what they'd try. Yeah, I can imagine. All right. So what other fun stuff can we do? Um... Yeah, we'll try one of the other signposts. Let's try a shootout, eh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just keep coming. <laughs> that guy was crawling. Uh, um, fuck out. Oh, you gotta click on the thing to reload. All right. Yeah, get him. Oh, I'm getting distracted by the five cent beer sign, though. Beer for five cents is pretty good. Oh, man, they just they keep coming. Oh. Uh, um, one over here now. Uh, oh, good crap. shooting, partner. Here's your reward. We got a good guy. Oh, and you get money for it. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Do we just? Oh, and there's just more areas to do it in. Nice. Yeah, cool. Cool, man. <laughs> just this one guy crawling, though. Keep shooting innocent guys, though. Uh, yep, that's a gunslinger. He knew the risks. Yeah. <laughs> but a shout out friendly. Just not have a gun on you. I, I don't know how to get rid of the white borders, unfortunately, but yeah, it's not, not admiring the experience that much. Um, yep, oh, keep missing them. <laughs> Just the janky ass animation on them, though. It's solid. It's Here's fucking... your reward, partner, for doing away with those no good rustlers. Yeah, nice. All right, and what do we get to spend our money on, though? Can we just, can we leave? Yeah, all right. What do we got for guns? Have gun, oh, you can choose to have shootouts as you're wandering. Yeah, righto, righto, okay. What do we got for lingo? Oh, wow, just a full, that is certainly a lot of lingo. Calico, camphor, can openers, cat ass. Chamber pot, cholera. Coffee varnish was what they called bad coffee. Nice. Oh, yeah. Padre, conductor, 
Consumption, see tuberculosis. No, we know all about tuberculosis. We've we've all seen Tombstone. Uh, Derringer, yeah, yeah, just all. I've heard of most of these, just like from, you know, cultural fucking um, osmosis. Um, so let's we'll go back to town. Um, there's got to be. I I, I want to spend like at least another twenty five minutes on this. I reckon, and it, it seems like there's like fun stuff to do at every location is, is there anything you guys want to check out i'll just i'm sort of picking just for the sake of interest and stuff but um yeah if you want to check out somewhere specific just let me know um i'm liking the look of the undertaker though get some get some morbid ass facts for the, at the undertakers is there a gold mine probably not because they're usually like out next to a mountain or something if i remember correctly and they used to just have like separate camps out there. But um, yeah, no, yeah, no, no mine. And check the Undertaker again. Mortality in the Old West was pretty high because of diseases and dangerous occupations. And on the average, <laughs> most this folks didn't doing? live much beyond He's their late forties. Just trying to 40s. do fart noises with the hands. His wife Josie Same had this two guy. children, but neither survived. Oh, I'm so sad. That's why the Undertaker always had a pine box ready to go. Also, having a coffin and a few headstones <clears throat> out front was pretty effective advertising. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> fun way to sell people. Um, These here tombstones are blank now, but in a town filled with gunfighters and gamblers and rustlers, they won't stay empty for long. Over time, many of these headstones would carry elaborate mementos of their owner's exploits. One great example is, here lies Lester Moore, four slugs from a 44, no less, no more. <laughs> but even tombstones God, newspapers are called old the epitaph. Yep. All right. You might think the Undertaker's parlor would be a body's last stop before they got buried, but for an outlaw who'd made his last stand, that might not be true. The lawman who'd shot him might just bring him in here to get him fixed up a bit and then take him over to the photographers for a last picture. Many fallen rascals were photographed posthumously in lifelike uh, or, or death-like poses. These pictures were nifty trophies for those straight shooting marshals and deputies, some of whom modestly inserted themselves into the frame. <laughs> they were also intended to scare off the other bad guys into a lawful So it was the equivalent existence. of social media back in the day. The Undertaker himself was actually a relatively new arrival in Wyatt Earp's day. Up until that I time, the funeral bad would guys. be handled Selfie. by the family themselves or by a doctor or even the carpenter who built the coffin. But just when some occupations were starting to disappear, like buffalo hunting, stagecoach driving, undertaking was a whole new wide field of opportunity, particularly, mind you, in any town that old Wyatt happened to live in. Yeah, I can imagine. Holy shit. And I keep going on about Wyatt Earp, but he had like th three brothers that were just as tough with him. It's about as Oh god, yeah, Logan Paul shit. In a rough and Got tumble kind of town like Tombstone, Undertakers were yeah, usually kept real busy. Yeah, the actual fucking photos could get of mighty like tired the, curtain bodies this around is, all yeah, day. Yeah, this is morbid. This here casket on wheels was used kind of like a gurney to move bodies while they were being prepared for burial. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, the actual wheel piece. Oh, God. <laughs> Someone's actually done it up for the, um, the thing I like. Put a fake body in there Originally, with a shroud. the word casket meant a container for precious objects. It's where women used to keep their jewels. So it was only natural that people would want to preserve their most precious loved ones in caskets. Hang on, I just... I saw a thing there, like someone had fucked up the receipt. They'd written like five cents for expenses and then just cross it out and put ten dollars. There was no more stern <laughs> reminder of the hereafter than a cross. Sometimes all a preacher had to do was stand next to one. With just one look, he could set folks to thinking about who'd be next and wondering if they was in good standing with their maker. <laughs> As funerals became more and more elaborate, funeral parlors started looking more and more like churches. Some places even had an organ to play somber music while loved ones paid their last respects to the dearly departed. Yeah. Cool, 
somebody. I mean, it's messed up, but yeah, and actually having like your fucking workbench with all your tools just in there is is fucking. So what do you got? Yeah, you got some crosses, tombstones, all your all your work wood tools there. Well, what do we have here? Looks like a skull. I reckon this here Undertaker got himself a good sense of humor. Or maybe he just didn't like working alone. <laughs> These here are the Undertaker's tools of the trade. Not only did he have to be a bit of a scientist, he also had to be a skilled carpenter. Even though fancy caskets were available from back east, most folks in the west were still buried in simple wooden coffins, which the Undertaker made right here in his shop. Alright, well, let's leave all this morbid stuff alone. Oh! Your reward's a silver dollar for the right answer to my question. Yeah, pretty sure that's Spook Hill. God, we're, we're making some fucking scratch here, that's for sure. No idea what I can actually spend the money on. Maybe if we go to the, um... Gen um... Was there a general store? I might be able to... Yeah. See if I can actually buy something with my hard-earned money. If there's one thing the Old West had plenty of, it's barrels. That's because long before there was fancy packaging, most foodstuffs came in barrels. Coffee, tea, flour, biscuits, crackers, macaroni, heck, they, the list is endless. You just figured out how much you wanted, and the shopkeeper pulled it out of a barrel and wrapped it up in manila paper or put it in bags. Huh. A general store like this here was also known as a shebang. That apparently came from an Irish word meaning an informal sort of tavern. You huh. see... This wasn't just a place to shop. It was also a place where folks could gather to drink and talk, even in dry towns. So, if you ever wondered where we got our expression, the whole shebang, well, now you know, partner. By yeah. the way, like the owner of the Blame dry the goods store for, across town, always. the keeper of this general store would usually become one of the more prominent, popular folks around. Besides selling people the stuff they needed, and I've just and noticed that too, like barkeep, whatever they did in recording, they must have figured out and actually put in a, um, just a plain good pop filter on their mic because it doesn't sound anywhere near as prominent in this. That's pretty impressive. That's right, partner. Fresh onions can't make a good chili sauce without them. Even mm. though the tin coated mm. metal can was oh, invented in England in the early 1800s, Lead most fresh vegetables syrup. in the West were stocked right out in front where everyone could see them. Yeah, nice. All right. Um, yeah, still checking the place out. Yeah, what else we got here? Yeah, like it. Oh no, hang on. There's. I just noticed there is a little, little thing to the mine, but it doesn't let us go there. Okay, that's a little disappointing. That's. But yeah, like this is amazing. The amount of content in this, and just being able to like physically walk around and explore everything as well. It's just. Yeah, this is mad. I really like this. Um, yeah, let's go to the Mexican residence. It's just one, is it just one guy's house? This here is one of the shacks that our town's Mexican population lived in. By the way, the first cowboys were Mexican. They were called vaqueros, and that came from the Spanish word for cow. But really? it sounded like oh. buckaroo to English speakers, so uh. that name stuck. We uh, inherited a whole right. mess of other Western lingo from the Mexican yeah, vaqueros, vaqueros too, sounds uh, badass, along with their sorry. gear. Uh, their rawhide rope. La Riata became Lariat, and them rawhide pants, chaparreras, came down to us as chaps. Huh. To find out more about the Mexicans' role in the Old West, amble on down to the cantina where they used to gather. And to find out more about how they live day to day, click around this building. Yeah, right, eh? Um, anything else we can really click on here? No. Well, let's go to the cantina then. Um, was, there's a cantina. Is it... Roses, will nighttime find me here? Hombres, senoritas, right this way to visit the cantina. And just click anywhere if you want to skip my little cross-cultural introduction. Mexicans in the Old West found them... Oh, uh, I guess we got the intro and skipped for us. ...selves in a unique... Oh. Now, Wyatt Earp's town of Tombstone was in southern Arizona. The last jigsaw piece plugged into the old continental U.S. of A. Way back in 1853. The town was close enough to the Mexican border that you could pay your bills in pesos. Still, Arizona's Mexican residents weren't exactly made to feel at home. Swindled out of much of their land and excluded from skilled trades, they were forced into poor paying jobs like chopping wood, making charcoal, and other manual labor. 
Since there weren't no red carpet inviting them into the Anglos' watering holes and town's Mexican folks and hanging out in places like this. And at this cantina, amigo, everybody's welcome. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there. Do you know this music, too? Yeah, that's cool. What can we, what sort of stories can we get? This piano might have provided the accompaniment for the folk ballads that were sung here. These songs told about the lives and deaths of celebrated vaqueros and sung the praises of the legendary guerrilla fighters who resisted the Anglo takeover of the Southwest. The ballads were called corridos, and you can still hear them sung today. During Wyatt Earp's mm, later I've years, one vaquero you might have heard immortalized in a song was Juan Laibus. He won a silver trophy at the West's first organized rodeo in Prescott, Arizona in 1888. When an adobe fireplace like this was placed along the middle of a wall, folks would commonly build a small partition beside it to create a kind of artificial corner. It was called a paridcita, which meant little wall. It shielded the fireplace from drafts. Like this roof up was here made too. of brush, mud plaster, and earth, and was supported by beams made out of pine logs. Whole thing kept the sun out just fine, but wouldn't hold up against rain very well. It was kind of a desert thing. Yeah, I guess you wouldn't really worry too much about rain in the this desert. this year bar, folks told stories of legendary Mexican banditos. They were masked men on fast horses who robbed and harassed wealthy Anglo landowners and miners. The most famous of these desperados was Joaquin Morieta, who was known throughout much of the Southwest, <laughs> even though he never really existed. He was actually a blend of several real-life, small-time bandits who really did rob ranchers and miners. This was for revenge, after native Mexicans were thrown off their lands and out of mines. Actually, this legend was even better than reality, because when some Mexican-American really did get away with a little revenge robbery, his compadres would just say, must have been Joaquin who did it. <laughs> okay. At this here bar... Ah, no, we, we had that one. We just wanted to turn right. At this table, you might have found why... Yeah, we're sort of getting... Definitely getting a hell of an inf At info this dump, bar, I'm not going to lie. Um, okay, let's, let's see. Oh, fuck, he's new silver up dollar, again. Give me the right answer to this question. Uh, what was it? Parisita? Yeah, nice. He can show I've been paying attention, getting those those fucking silver dollars. Nice. Um, love to be able to figure out. Yeah, because there's obviously a secret if it's giving me like actual inventory items. Like that's pretty cool. Um, don't know what they unlock though, but yeah, just really fun. I, I, I might even spend some time with this just off stream, just to check it out. Um, we kind of we've sort of done get just. Yeah, we've done a bit of morbid stuff. We've done the Undertakers. Don't need to do the gallows. Um, what else we got? Yeah, let's check out the restaurant. See if there's any factoids. Oh, that's that's kind of that's actually not a bad Photoshop for the time. This here's the Can Can Restaurant, <laughs> named after the one in Tombstone. It claimed to be named after the famous Can Can Dance Hall over there in yonder in Gay Paris. Its menu boasted of serving deer, antelope, and even bear meat. Plus, lobsters Bammy. and fish nice. imported by fast stagecoach from the coast of Mexico. Of course, some locals said that the name came from the fact that everything in the menu actually came out of a can. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, we're getting any, like, oh, we can't go in, unfortunately. Okay. This here's the can can. No, uh, we did do that. Um, oh, we can go to the laundry, though. Now, what's going on in the laundry? I, I can't actually read that. It never been in water. Man and lady laundry. This table saw a lot of elbow grease mixed with just plain frontier grit. The industrious Chinese who came to America to seek their fortune beside the other immigrants had a much tougher time than the Europeans. Their culture and language were different and that made them a target for ill treatment. Even though they helped build the railroad and mine for gold, many of them had to settle for the more menial jobs. Out west, many of the Chinese ran laundries. The work was hard. There was no plumbing, so they had to haul water. They'd boil the clothing and 
soap made of animal fat or beeswax, often adding bluing, lye, ammonia, or borax. After the laundry dried, they'd iron the pieces on a table like this, using irons that weighed anywhere from a four-pound small iron to a 17-pound charcoal family iron. Bloody hell. I'm working to clothes clean, I guess. Huh. There you go. Um... Yeah, just, well, there's a hotel here. Like, yeah, it looks like we can go in here. A hotel might seem like a luxury, but for a western town in Earp's day, it was more like a necessity. There weren't enough permanent dwellings yet to house the would-be settlers, uh, let alone the traveling The guy that's a voiceover for this game has his work cut out for him, yeah. <laughs> now, luxury wasn't always the idea. At one western hotel, a guest flinched <laughs> when he saw a dirty roller towel, so the innkeeper reassured him, there are 26 men used that towel before you, and you're the first one that complained. <laughs> there, there were fancier hotels, too, like this one. They might cost $10 a week compared to 6 over at the boarding house, but they were worth the difference because they were a whole bunch nicer. Did you want to check in, partner, or take a look around the lobby? Yeah, might as well. Oh, uh, yeah, that's where you get the shoe shined. Let's see out the door again. Oh, we get some roulette, though. Hey, partner, keep your eye out for stray roulette balls around town to begin the roulette action. You can actually play roulette if you find balls for it. Really? Oh, that's mad. The phone was invented in 1875 by Alexander Graham Bell. By 1900, there were more than a million of them in the country. The first models had only one opening that you talked into and listened to. Later on, there were two openings, but you had to crank the phone to get the juice going. Either way, you had to ring the operator first, and she could connect you to your loved ones. If they had a phone, that is. Okay. For your dollar fifty or so a day, you get a room with a bed, a washstand with a pitcher and a bowl, a lamp, and a chamber pot. If it was a fancy place like this one, you wouldn't even have to share your bed with a stranger. <laughs> oh, man, some people are into that. Oh, well. Wow. In 1881, Wyatt Earp posted a sign on the birdcage saying, Persons entering this house are required to divest themselves oh, with this bird cage, the, uh, the actual cat course, house. Not everyone did. One night, a mediocre magician told the audience he would catch bullets in his teeth. <laughs> he hit a few slugs in his mouth, and then he spit them out as his assistant was firing those blanks. Suddenly, a drunk stood up in the audience, pulled out his gun, and said, Catch this one, Professor. <laughs> 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 Luckily, a bystander jiggled the drunk's arm, and, and he missed. But you should have seen that magician hightail it out of there. <laughs> you can imagine. That would be fucking hilarious to see, though. Uh -huh. Best as anyone can figure, this picture is of old Billy Hutchinson, the owner of the birdcage. Billy always had a hankering to make his place more respectable. And he even started a ladies' night when ladies in Tombstone could get in for free. But no matter how hard he tried, the proper ladies never caught into the birdcage. And the married men probably found it more fun because the wives stayed away. <laughs> On top. Yeah, a couple more minutes and Most of the we'll so-called hostesses else, who worked the birdcage were really hostesses. ladies of the evening. Yes. These gals usually lived out back, behind this door. A back door was real convenient in a place like the birdcage because it allowed gentlemen to slip outside unseen. Now, Wyatt Earp knew many ladies of the evening in his day. In fact, several prostitutes using the name of Earp were arrested in Dodge City, though historians think that they may have just been Wyatt's distant relations. No fucking hell. Okay. The notorious Birdcage Theater in Wyatt's the Theater kept trying to become a <laughs> respectable family entertainment spot. So, they started a ladies' night on which, if and you were a lady, you'd be admitted free. Guess the price wasn't low enough, though, because not one lady showed up. In fact, no proper lady ever set foot in the Birdcage for years to come. Well, there you go. This here door led to the box office where you'd pay 50 cents to get in on opening night and 25 cents the rest of the time. That was a lot of money when the average fellow only earned around $3 a day. All the same, people were always lined up outside, waiting to fork over their money for a drink and a dance. 
Okay. Oh, the music repeats getting a little bit annoying though. Anything else fun in here? Um, I might do one more like actual internal location, and we'll. Um, Partner, if you answer my question yeah, true, we'll finish it up. I have a silver dollar for you. Uh, it was 1875, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, right, so what do we, what do we finish with? We did the laundry, um, surely they'd let us in the livery stable. What's, oh really? Oh no, there we go. This here's the livery stable. If you were new to town, you'd make a beeline over here first. It was like a combination parking lot and rent-a-car agency. Except that, since America hadn't gotten around to inventing the automobile yet, it dealt in horses. If yeah, you right. brought your own horse to town, you could park it here, and the livery folks would feed it and watch out for it. That way, you could go out drinking and gambling and carousing without having to worry about such responsibilities. Or, if you come to town by rail or stagecoach, you could rent a horse here. And for $5 a day, you could get a nice buggy, too. Now, if you're curious, just trot on over and poke your nose into whatever gear intrigues you. Yeah, okay. I'm sure it's not going to smell too good. It's probably smell like horse's ass. If you're traveling across the prairie, like Wyatt and his brothers did, this is the best seat in the house. Sitting up high on this wagon, you're kind of like the captain on the bridge of a ship. So it's no wonder that when these wagons were covered, they called them prairie schooners. Yeah, okay. Quite often, the livery would also double as a blacksmith, so you could always find a couple of spare wagon wheels lying around, waiting to get fixed. Yeah. Ooh, is that a roulette ball? I think that's a roulette ball. A lot of fun stuff in there. Once the sun went down, aside from the lights in the building... Yeah, we, we know how lanterns work. Just give us a, a spiel on livery stables. Well, easy. Anyone that's devices. ever been around horses knows that they eat a lot of hay. And the easiest way to move hay around is with a pitchfork and a rake. These tools were also used to move around the straw which is kind of like hay, but ain't much good for eating. The straw was used for horse bedding, which means the horses stood on it and manured it up real good. <laughs> <laughs> then, the pitchfork and the rake would be used to drag out the dirty straw and put in some new. These tools were also real What's important to prevent fires, uh, since fly. lots of old hay and straw sitting around long enough could catch on fire all by itself. Yeah. Yeah. Any more... Wherever there are horses, there's lots of, well, you know what. <laughs> These tools here are for the dirtiest job in the livery stable. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> you got it right, partner. Cleaning up the horse manure. Well, I think that's, a, that's definitely an interesting way to finish. Partner, I got you a silver dollar if you can answer my question right. Oh, uh, probably, um, stirrup? No, harness? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I think we better get Abby because he's, he's, he looks like he's into some s and sort of stuff. But my geez, that was fun. That was actually really cool. Um, and like I said, I'm probably going to you know, have a little explore for it with it um, yeah, further down the track. But yeah, all right. Amazing media. Uh, artist, engineer, technical service. I want to know who the old guy was. Old West host and voice George Killingsworth. Uh, that that doesn't sound um. Yeah, that doesn't sound real. Oh, and there's just the one guy as the gunfighter. Okay, no, that's fair enough. But no, that was that was pretty damn cool. Not gonna lie. I'm watching Death Sandals video, by the way. That's that's who the the person is. So if you want to watch a full playthrough, Death Death Sandals. <laughs> 